And we're so happy you're here to learn about Zionism and its critiques today um, with a uh, great scholar, Dr. Sarah Yael Hirschhorn, who is currently the visiting professor in Israel studies at the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern University. Her expertise focuses on diaspora Israel relations, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Israeli ultra-nationalist movement. Her first book, City on a Hilltop, American Jews and the Israeli Settler Movement, published by Harvard in 2017, hailed as a landmark contribution to the field, was the winner of the 2018 Sammy Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature Choice Award, a finalist for the 2017 National Jewish Book Award, and a nominee for the 2021 Graham Meyer Award in Religion. She's currently working on a new book manuscript tentatively entitled New Day in Babylon and Jerusalem, Zionism, Jewish Power and Identity Politics Since 1967 on American Zionism Since the Six-Day War. She teaches courses and mentors both undergraduate and graduate students in Israel studies and related fields. Prior to her appointment at Northwestern, Dr. Hirschhorn was the university re uh, research lecturer at Sydney Brichtow Fellow in Israel Studies at the University of Oxford from 2013 to 2018, and a postdoctoral fellow in Israel Studies at Brandeis from 2012 to 2013. She's a graduate of Yale University with her BA in the University of Chicago with an MA and PhD and the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships. Apart from her academic work, Dr. Hirschhorn is a, also a prominent voice bringing scholarship into the public square as a frequent public speaker, writer, media commentator, and foreign policy consultant on Israel and Jewish affairs. Follow her work at Sarah Hirschhorn One at Twitter. Uh, Professor Hirschhorn, thank you for joining us. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It is such a delight to be here. Rabbi Shmuley and I have been uh, trying to make this happen for quite some time. Um, and you know, as someone who I really, truly admire as a Jewish leader and really as a role model to me and so many others, I am so delighted to be invited by Rabbi Shmuley. And thank you, Alex, for also facilitating this event. Um, I apologize ahead of time that I broke my ankle uh, about three weeks ago. So um, if I'm sitting at a little bit of an odd angle for, for you, please let me know. I just try to keep my foot elevated while I talk. So I'll try to you know pivot as, as little as possible while I'm speaking uh, to uh, make sure that that doesn't uh, get disturbed. Um, today, I wanted to discuss um, a topic that I've called Zionism Mixed Critics, which is essentially I'm going to give you the one hour version of the 12 week university course that I teach uh, at Northwestern and elsewhere, which I hope will provide us something of an overview of um, Zionism or what we maybe should call small Z Zionisms, because uh, there is not one a homogeneous vision of Zionism, rather a multiplicity of different Zionist ideas, some of which have gone the distance in our public debate and others which have withered on the historical vine over time, as well as the plurality of anti-Zionist thinking that comes both from within the Jewish community as well as outside and the different forms that this has taken um, between 1882 and the present. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you, um, and I hope that we could talk through some of these different ideas, um, and uh, I will speak, I guess, for about half an hour or so, just to give you an overview of our um, overview of where we're going, and uh, then, uh, and then uh, I hope we'll be able to open it up for a vigorous conversation. Um, um, as Ravish Shmuley suggested, anytime you use the word Zionism in a sentence, that's sure to, um, you know, spark some debate, so I hope we'll have quite a lot to talk about. Um, so first I want to start, what is Zionism or what I've called maybe little z Zionisms? Um, and I want to propose a few ideas. First, that Zionism is the ideology, um, an ism in fact, of Jewish nationalism. Uh, and one of the uh, interests of historians of nationalism like myself is what are the differences and similarities between nationalisms um, around the world, say uh, European nationalisms, from which most of our canon of scholarship is based, and that of Jewish nationalism. Where, where is Zionism unique um, and part of Jewish history, um, which may be a uh, singular kind of history in the history of nationalisms, and where is Jewish nationalism the same as everyone else's? In fact, that may have been the early aspiration of Zionist thinkers, is that the state of the Jews would be no different than any other state on the map. Of course, we've seen that today that is not necessarily the case, and we need to investigate that a bit further. The second proposal I have for what Zionism is, is that it's Jewish self-determination and Jewish sovereignty. Um, this is, in fact, the expression of Jewish, uh, Jewish statehood um, and of Jewish self-determination. Um, but we'll have to speak about what kind of territorial aspirations this idea may have had, what were the 
boundaries or limits of what Jewish sovereignty meant to early Zionist thinkers and how that's evolved over time. The third proposal I have for you is that Zionism is the national liberation movement to the Jewish people. This puts Zionism in line with many of the uh, processes of decolonization that occurred around the 19, 1948 and later, of course, a second wave around 1967, 1968 uh, around the world. Uh, and in many cases, Zionism has had some of the similar problems as many other new states that came into existence in the 20th and even the 21st century, which is it is often difficult to make the transition from being a ideological movement in service of uh, self-determination to one that needs to govern um, over a diverse population, enact laws, um, you know, take care of the daily business of the state, even do the kind of mundane things like arranging, you know, your garbage pickup on Thursdays. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult to move from, you know, national liberation movement to having to do, do the business of everyday life. And I'd like to think about Zionism and maybe some of the, um, you know, problems or pitfalls of Zionism today in that larger trajectory. Last but not least, Zionism was developed as one answer to what was called the Jewish problem or the Jewish question in Europe, which addressed the failure of full emancipation of the Jews that despite the fact that Jews were accorded a new status after the French Revolution um, and new constitutional reforms across Europe and even parts of the Middle East, including the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, it never seemed that Jews fully reached more than a kind of juridical equality with their Christian and sometimes Muslim neighbors. Uh, the emancipation, in fact, I think we could say was something of a failure in Europe, uh, and this led some thinkers to develop new alternatives. There were, of course, those who intended to stay in Europe and, uh, you know, uh, either uh, and find new ideological ways to address uh, problems of assimilation, whether that was um, a more socialist alternative or the Bund, or frankly, those who put their hopes in foreign powers that they would remain safe and secure in their in their European lives, which of course, I guess, is the dream that was decimated by the Holocaust. There were those who chose immigration to the United States or the United Kingdom or other countries around the world um, who did not have a great interest in Zionism, were not, you know, budding with uh, ideological fervor for Jewish nationalism, in fact, just wanted to get out of Dodge and go anywhere, which is probably how many of our grand grandparents and great-grandparents ended up in the United States around the turn of the century. And then there were those, a minority in Europe, only about 5% of European Jews held the shekel or sort of the token of membership within the Zionist movement. Uh, prior to the Second World War, that believed in this idea of Jewish uh, of Jewish sovereignty and and uh, Jewish self determination, and wanted to immigrate to a place where they felt that the Zionist uh, activity could be carried out. Of course, there was a long conversation within the early Zionist congresses about where that place should be, but eventually it was settled on uh, what was then Ottoman and later British Palestine. Um, so the Zionism was only one possible answer to the Jewish problem or the Jewish question in Europe, but it is one that we will discuss further today. But Zionism as an early ideology didn't necessarily resolve all the burning questions that were associated with this new ism or this new nationalism of the turn of the 21st century, excuse me, the turn of the 20th century. And there were a few questions that remain uh, vague or perhaps uh, or perhaps even uh, undiscussed. The first was, does Zionism need a piece of territory to realize its aspirations and where should that be located? The early Zionist Congress debated various possible land parcels for everywhere from Uganda to Argentina, and there are later visions of Zionism that could have taken place everywhere from Bureau Bijan in Siberia to upstate New York. It wasn't clear that um, a piece of territory was needed at all. Um, we'll speak about that further in a moment. And if so, that it should be located where it is roughly today uh, in the Middle East. Zionist thinkers also argued about different forms of government, economic systems, social and religious orders, institutions, and cultures that Zionism could and should produce. We'll speak more about that in a moment. There was no necessarily one answer about what Zionism looked like on the ground and how that should be, um, how that should be practiced um, and what kind of institutions should develop the idea further. Um, last but not least, was self-determination and Zion sovereignty and national liberation equivalent to statehood? Is it more than just having a piece of territory and a state and a flag and a parliament and a prime minister? Is it less than that? Um, is statehood only kind of a early precondition for what Zionism is or are they equivalent? Is Zionism equivalent to the state of Israel today or to a state 
anywhere uh, in the future or in the past. Um, and of course, the burning question, I guess, that Zionism has yet to resolve is will Zionism essentially solve the Jewish question and the Jewish problem? Will Zionism afford full emancipation from Jewish people for all of the Jewish people or only some of the Jewish people, the Jewish people who live there? Jewish people, what about the Jewish people who don't live there? What about the Jewish people who do live there who aren't Jews, who, people who live there who aren't Jews? Um, what about, you know, different kinds of Jews? We'll have to talk about that. Um, and also are Jews and others safe and secure within the state of Israel today? I think we know that Israel has many security challenges and the future of the state of Israel uh, remains uncertain in a very volatile region. So uh, I think we'll want to reflect at the end of this session about whether Zionism has really truly solved the Jewish problem of Europe or perhaps even the Jewish problem of America today with rising rates of anti-Semitism um, or what the future will be. I want to turn uh, also to just give a, to say a few words about what anti-Zionism was both then and now before we take a more deeper dive into some of these different visions. For the first is to say that anti-Zionism is as old as Zionism itself. In fact, Zionism's fiercest critics in its earliest days were, uh, were Haredi rabbis in Europe that felt that anti-Zionism was a perversion of God's will, that it was, uh, that it was hastening the coming of the Messiah through human will, a kind of uh, you know, uh, an absolutely sinful act um, that you know put human uh, that put uh, that, that took I guess God's hand out of history that humans were trying to usurp godly godly will. And anti-Zionism uh, was rather um, I guess we could say unpopular amongst various segments of the Jewish community uh, in its from its earliest moments of existence. Uh, Anti-Zionism existed, I guess, on both the left or the right, or what we might also call the secular religious flanks of the Jewish community um, from the beginning. We'll talk a little bit more about um, left-wing alternatives as well. But when we think about anti-Zionism as it has evolved from its earliest moment of, say, the protester rabbinate in Hungary to what we may see on the streets of um, many, you, uh, many global capitals today, I think we need to consider a few factors which we'll speak about further. The first is the difference between endogenous and exogenous critiques of Zionism, meaning critiques of Zionism that come from within the Jewish community and those that come from outside, which I think have a significantly different um, ideology as well as tenor. The relationship between theory and praxis, are we critiquing Zionism as an idea or are we critiquing the way Zionism has manifested itself on the ground in the state of Israel in 2022? Those are different, different quantities. I think we could say that critique of the business of the state of Israel or the policies of the state of Israel generally falls within legitimate criticism of any government or institution. Um, a, a broader critique about whether Jews deserve self-determination, um, I think is a more ideological um, conversation and we can discuss what we think about that further. Um, and that I think directly relates to the conversation that we're having today about where is this blurry line between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And I'll come back to some of these ideas at the end of our session. But first I wanted to pivot to a few different understandings of Zionism or Zionisms um, that I mentioned earlier. The first, of course, is the most well-known version of Zionism, political Zionism or practical Zionism that was the brainchild of Theodor Herzl, um, a journalist and thinker uh, in Vienna, uh, who was probably a very unlikely forefather of Zionism. He was not a man who grew up with a great deal of Yiddishkeit or had uh, a, a very strong affiliation with the Jewish community. In fact, he only came to these ideas about Zionism and about Jewish identity um, in middle age, uh, particularly during his coverage of the Dreyfus trial in France uh, for, uh, for uh, as part of his, you know, as part of his newsman work. Um, and he began to realize that anti-Semitism remained endemic in Europe and that structural anti-Semitism, what we might call structural anti-Semitism today was prevalent in France. Um, and he began to think about what the role of Jews was going to be now and in the future and in what the so-called enlightened capitals like Vienna or Paris and the places that he you know, spent his time and uh, you know, the milieus in which he circulated. And he came to realize that the future of the Jews perhaps was no longer going to be in Europe. And this was articulated first in a pamphlet called Der Judenstaat, uh, which is often translated today as the Jewish state but I think more accurately should be translated as the state of the Jews. And there's a significant difference between these two ideas in the sense that Herzl envisioned a kind of uh, 
a kind of Jewish state uh, on the Mediterranean, the way that Vienna was an empire on the Danube. He uh, did not see a role for religious authority. He did not necessarily put too much emphasis on the Jewish character of a future state. He was mostly interested that Jews should have a place for uh, national, national self-determination and sovereignty more than the particular um, uh, role of Judaism or Jewish, uh, Jewishness in the character of the state. Uh, and in that sense, we can see him as the progenitor of the modern Knesset, or even as the, the you can see the photo on the bottom right of the government, which, which unfortunately just collapsed last week. In Israel, the most broad-based coalition in Israeli history that included uh, everything from the you know, Zionist left to the Islamist right um, within this new, uh, within this new uh, parliamentary uh, government. So Theodor Herzl's political Zionism, of course, is, is the Zionism, I guess, that we could say has uh, gone the distance in Zionist history. It is something that we still are thinking about and talking about today. Um, although I think at the end of the session, we can contemplate whether Theodor Herzl himself would recognize what the state of Israel has become uh, in, the 20, in the 21st century. But there were other visions of Zionism that are perhaps less well known to uh, many or most audiences that still have a role to play in shaping what the Zionist idea was and perhaps could be in the future. One of those was uh, what I might call cultural Zionism that was primarily associated with a man called the Chada Am, which in Hebrew literally means one of the people, a pen name for the writer and intellectual Asher Speed Ginsburg. Cultural Zionism um, differed significantly from political Zionism in the sense that a Jewish homeland uh, was not necessarily so significant as a part of political uh, or uh, nationalist currency for Chada Am. It was more relevant as a spiritual center for Jewish people. Many, most of the Jews in Asher Tzvi Ginsburg's understanding would go elsewhere. In fact, many of them, uh, you know, from his hometown of Odessa, ended up in the United States. And um, but he knew that 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 the future Zionist homeland and perhaps something again short of statehood uh, might serve as a kind of city on a hilltop or a kind of beacon to the Jewish community in developing the Jewish soul and the Jewish spirit in the future. Asher Tzvi Ginsburg in his own lifetime was kind of a frenemy of Theodor Herzl. They argued vigorously about these different ideas and I guess I guess we can say in that contest of personalities or ideologies, Herzl certainly won out. But I believe that cultural Zionism still exists in Israel today in the sense that Israel remains a kind of spiritual center for Judaism and for, uh, and for Jewish ideas and Jewish ritual practice for Jews around the world. Um, there are even, even a new book by a political science professor at Tel Aviv University called Yossi Shane, who has argued that this is Israel's century as opposed to the European or the American century, where Israel will be the, will be the font of Jewish thinking and Jewish understanding going forward. Uh, we also might see cultural Zionism manifested in characters like the former president of Israel, Ruvi Rivlin, um, or in thinkers like Bernard Avishai, who have really tried to develop what might be a uh, Hebrew culture and a uh, Zionist worldview um, from you know, Han Am to today. There were also questions about what would happen not just in the you know highfalutin ideas of the you know the the territorial versus the spiritual, but what was what was going to be the reality of what seemed to be ensuing conflict with Israel's neighbors um, and with an indigenous population that Zionist thinkers like Theodor Herzl, who had only visited the land of Israel once in his lifetime, really didn't seem to take into account in in, in thinking of their own ideologies. And when they did. It was really only with the kind of colonialist vision of Siegel Atriques of a bringing a you know colonial betterment um, to an indigenous people that was you know very much uh, in the milieu of Herzl's time that uh, that shaped his his view of what Zionism could be. But certainly by the 1920s and 1930s, when someone like Vladimir Jabotinsky, another co-patriot of Ahad Am from from Odessa, began to think about on um, what what was emerging and, 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 and sustained conflict with um, an indigenous population and with Israel's neighbors, um, the questions of whether, uh, whether, whether Jews could live together or, with, or live apart became very prominent in Zionist thought. Revisionist Zionism, of course, argued for what will later be known as the Iron Wall, that Israel needed to take all military 
and, uh, and aggressive postures to prevent its own destruction. And only later, once Israel had secured itself as a, as a state and as a, uh, and as a strong territorial and political entity, could it possibly uh, make peace with its neighbors. One question we have today are who are the true heirs of Vladimir Chabotinsky? They are often cited as those who later carried the flag of revisionist Zionism into the Kherut and later the Likud party. So those like former Prime Minister Menachem Begin or Benjamin Netanyahu. But we might want to think about whether these figures truly represent the original ideas of Vladimir Jabotinsky or whether they've gone in their own directions. And we could probably discuss that more in the Q&A. Of course, there are others who had other ideas about living together or living apart, including Martin Buber, uh, who was the foref forefather of what was known as the binationalist idea um, in, in uh, Zionist thinking. Uh, unlike Jabotinsky, he believed that Israel and Jews could live alongside their neighbors and hopefully could even come to some kind of territorial and political arrangement that would allow them to live together. Um, his ideas, of course, did not gain widespread currency within the early Zionist movement or within the Shu, the Jewish, Jewish community in Palestine, uh, in British Palestine. Um, but as a professor at the Hebrew University and uh, in concert with some other intellectuals, his idea did, did remain and has inspired future generations. I think today though, we might say that the binationalist idea has had a stronger impact on the Palestinian national movement than it has on the Zionist movement uh, in speaking about a state for all citizens. Um, which has been kind of, I think, the mantra of much of the Palestinian national movement um, of late. Um, and we can come back to why his ideas didn't seem to really take root amongst the Zionist community, but did have more impact on others uh, in the community. Of course, there also were critiques of Zionism from both the left and the right, from those who were affiliated with um, a socialist community, um, who, you know, who were, who thought about, uh, you know, the future of, uh, future of uh, you know, workers of the world rather than Jews of the world. Um, those may still be found in some echoes today in the large Russian and perhaps even today recent Ukrainian Aliyah. Um, but there were also uh, critiques from the religious right, including those that we had mentioned before that were dead set against Zionism, but also characters like Rabbi Abraham Yusuf Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of uh, British Palestine, who tried to synthesize the secular and the religious to find new ways to accommodate Zionism within a religious vision. He might be considered as the kind of grandfather of what we know today as religious Zionism. Um, his son, Rabbi Huda Kuk, who founded uh, it, who was a very pivotal figure in the photo that you see on the bottom of Yeshiva Atmar Kazara, the, the yeshiva um, that had a very uh, had a very prominent role um, in training a whole cadre of new religious Zionist leaders in the state of Israel, including many of those who were the early founders of the settler movement. Um, has had a very prominent impact on the face of Israeli society, even to the most recent face of the prime ministership, like Naftali Bennett, um, a figure who identifies largely with the religious Zionist movement and his party um, particularly has catered to those kinds of voters. Um, more recently, since the 1948 war, we have to think about how many of these Zionist Zionisms or Zionist ideologies have evolved over time. I've mentioned that some have gone the distance in, in history, others have withered on fine, but there are also new innovations that have occurred since 1948 with the changing demographics of the state of Israel. And obviously, um, you know, the very existence of the state of Israel, um, the state of Israel that came, came about in 1948, the one state, a state of Israel emerged and a state of Palestine did not. And this has largely influenced um, many of the critiques of Zionism or the new, new faces of Zionism since 1948. Of course, one comes from, um, from what we might call race, so I'm a little uncomfortable using that term in the context of Israel-Palestine, which I think is more specific to the American context, but certainly the large influx of Mizrahi immigrants, Jews from Arab lands that came to Israel after the 1948 war. Today, Israel is a major has a majority minority population in, um, of Mizrahi Jews, which actually today outnumber demographically Ashkenazi Jews. And this has influenced the way Mizrahi thinkers and Mizrahi Zionists have thought about the way early Zionism was developed, which you've noticed, I think already, you know, came mostly from the European continent from, from within Ashkenazi Jewry. And many of the voices of Mizrahi Jews that existed both in the pre-state period and certainly since then 
um, have largely not been incorporated within the larger canon of Zionism. We still think about Zionism as the Zionism as Herzl instead of the Zionism of Mizrahi Jews. Um, and much of the critique of Zionism has come from within the Mizrahi community and particularly their feeling that Israel has become something of an ethnocracy, that there are different tiers of privilege or citizenship within, within Israeli society. Of course, this also extends to the um, to the Arab Israeli population of Israel, which includes both Palestinian citizens of Israel as well as other Arabic speaking minorities that today comprise about 20% of Israel, Israel's population. But in fact, became kind of accidental Zionists after 1948. They didn't really plan on living within a new state of Israel, but that's how things shook out when the dust settled at the end of the 1948 war. Many of their co-patriots, of course, ended up in, uh, in the Middle East or in the Palestinian diaspora, um, but some, of course, were the remnant within, within the state of Israel itself and how they see living within a state of Israel, a state that perhaps they don't ideologically affiliate with in the way that a Jewish Israeli would, but still it is their place of residence and where they work and live and, you know, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and experience on a day-to-day -day basis has become an important part of the critique of Zionism since 1948. Um, and as well as uh, questions of gender that you know certainly have been prominent. Mostly we've been talking about Zionist men who have been the thinkers behind the Zionist movement. Um, certainly today we might want to extend that to questions of gender and sexuality that are all, you know are relevant to today's Israel. Just to say a few words about some of the critiques of Zionism from, from within. Those, of course, continue to include um, uh, some elements of the ultra-Orthodox community. Of course, uh, you're probably most familiar with the Nature Carta, who are, who are pictured here that you might see outside of you know, protests or other, um, you know, other events, uh, Zionist events, um, you know, picketing. And of course, they're a very fringe faction within the Haredi community, but there is still resistance from the religious right, I guess, to the Zionist idea. Although today, Israel has about 12% of the population that are Haredi themselves, and they have a very interesting role to play in Israel today, where they live in Israel, much like um, Arab citizens of Israel, without necessarily fully recognizing or, uh, or acknowledging the Zionist regime under which they live yet. Of course, they are raising families and joining the workforce in increasing numbers and living their lives uh, within this Zionist state and how this plays out today, which is a major element of, his, of the drama of Israeli politics, as well as in the future when it's estimated the Haredi population will comprise about a quarter of Israel's um, demography is certainly a very influential question uh, for the future. It is also a very important question for Jews in the diaspora because today the largest constituency that we may imagine in a generation or two in the United States or in Europe will certainly be Haredi as many liberal denominations are dwindling in numbers. So the face of American Zionism and the face of American Judaism in the future is more likely to be Haredi uh, than, than not. And this will certainly have a very profound impact on diaspora Israel relations going forward. There's also, of course, a growing, uh, growing movement within the Zionist left today, one that of course existed in the pre-state period. Uh, we should also remember that up until the 1960s and more, American Zionists were very uh, lukewarm, I guess we could say, about, um, about, this, about the Jewish state. Uh, and even uh, in the 1950s, an organization like the AGC was signing what was known as the Blaustein Ben-Gurion Agreement, where essentially there was a kind of a non-interference pact agreed upon between American Jews and Israel that you know, each of us are, uh, should develop in our own ways, but we're certainly not uh, close enough to want to tie our futures to one another. After the 1967 war was a total watershed moment. Um, in, in a change from a non-Zionist or even anti-Zionist position, both within religious denominations as well as the organized Jewish community towards a strong Zionist impulse. But uh, today, I think we see a resurgence of some of those earlier, um, earlier attitudes towards Zionism within particularly the American Jewish community, but also increasingly in other diaspora Jewish communities. Though um, I think we can speak more in the Q&A about the differences between the American Jewish community and other diasporas have different affiliations to what the idea of Zionism is that we spoke about earlier in this lecture and some elements of those that thinking that may be more relevant to those Jews who live in more precarious positions than American Jews um, and our own community here in the United States. Now, of course, there are also critics uh, uh, within the state of Israel of, of the Zionist idea. Um, we spoke earlier about um, those within the Arab Israeli community, particularly the Palestinian Israeli community, who became sort of accidental Zionists and 
you know, I think a strong critique of Zionism that still emerges from that community, including members of the Knesset um, who have voiced, voiced, these, um, voiced these critiques. Um, and then those critics, non-Jewish critics, um, and non-Israeli critics outside of Israel. Um, and this is, I think, what we're seeing most prominently in, in um, our communities in the United States and certainly in the media today um, of those who um, are outside of our community, although often within uh, what is known as a progressive community here um, in the United States and elsewhere, particularly those who may be affiliated with the boycott, sanctions, and divestment movement, which has become an important um, platform or uh, organizational banner for many of those who are critics of Zionism, um, but also, of course, um, you know, more militant factions that exist, uh, you know, both within and outside the Arab world. This has become a significant voice uh, in our public conversation about Zionism. Um, I think we are debating uh, what the true impacts of this will be, not only sort of in the economic sense of the boycott sanctions and the divestment movement and, and how that may impact the economy um, and stability of the state of Israel, but also what this will mean for the legitimacy of Jewish nationalism, a Jewish liberation movement, Jewish self-determination, Jewish sovereignty, all those visions of Zionism that we talked about earlier in the session in the public sphere. Um, I, I think we're seeing a very important unfolding conversation happening um, you know, in our own time. Um, I certainly have seen uh, quite a lot of this um, on a university campus. Um, and I would say that what happens on a university campus no longer stays on a university campus, that a university campus, I think, has increasingly become a pipeline towards um, you know, uh, involvement in maybe local and then national politics um, or in corporate, corporate, the corporate world or in other important institutions. So I think we should really be thinking very carefully about what kinds of conversations are happening here and also what the message of these groups is. Um, as I said earlier, there's certainly you know, room to critique the state of Israel like any other country. The question that I think becomes more significant is what is the line between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Where does, I guess, a delegitimization of the Zionist idea that Jews themselves are entitled to a piece of territory, that Jews are entitled to some degree of sovereignty or self-determination, that Jews can have a national liberation movement, that Jews may need to find a safe refuge from um, from other, uh, from other regimes that perhaps don't entitle them to the full emancipation that they hope for, um, will, that, will that fundamental idea of what Zionism is be discounted by the international community? Um, and I think uh, this is a very important and ongoing conversation, hopefully maybe something that we can talk more about in the Q&A. So I'm gonna leave this here. I hope this gave you a very broad overview of some of the dynamics we've dealt with um, from 1882 to the present in half an hour or so. And hopefully we can have a good conversation um, about some of these uh, topics. Wonderful, Dr. Hirshhorn. Thank you so much um, for, that, for that fantastic presentation. We'd love to open the conversation. Who would like to ask a question? Don't be uh, shy. I have a question. Dr. Hirshhorn, thank you so much for this great overview. I, at Northwestern University, what has been your experience with the undergrads? What kind of new perspectives have you noticed among Gen Z and millennials? And what kind of uh, new uh, questions that you've not experienced before are you getting from some of your undergrads? Um, so thank you, thank you for asking. Um, first of all, I should say that my, my classes are very full. In fact, they're oversubscribed. So I can say that there is still interest amongst um, you know, Gen Z in these questions. And um, my students are very engaged in this subject material. I feel that um, in my classroom, they have not been shy about sharing their views. Um, we've had very vigorous debates. Um, of course, you know, my classes are not intended to change anybody's minds or change anybody's politics, more to enrich their historical understanding. And I think that, you know, we've had some really um, interesting and important conversations about this. But what I would say is that my students also tell me that they don't feel comfortable or safe sharing their views in many spaces outside of my classroom. And sometimes I feel like if I didn't teach them anything, 
Um, I would succeed only in that I provided them a place to talk to one another, um, you know, I guess supervised by a grown up, you know, a grown up babysitter, um, you know, to give them an opportunity to speak to one another because they say that they feel um, that other spaces on campus are not necessarily open to these kinds of discussions and that the uh, discussion on social media, of course, which they've been very engaged in during the COVID years, mostly because they often, you know, weren't even on campus and were sitting, you know, sitting behind their screens has become quite toxic. Um, and it's become very difficult for them to um, have these kinds of conversations in other spaces and that Israel Palestine in particular has become kind of a third rail of campus politics. And if you want to, you know, if you want to be popular and you want to have someone to sit with in the cafeteria better shy away from shy away from those issues, um, you know, at your plural. I think also um, it has become increasingly difficult for um, uh, students to find an outlet. I do wonder sometimes, um, even though my classes are full, are my classes representative of the broader campus community? The titles of my classes include words like Zionism and its critics, modern Israel, the 1948 war, are, is there a segment of students who look through the, you know, who look through the course offerings every semester and say, oh, no, I wouldn't go anywhere near a class like that. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be associated with that concept. So are the students in my classes, you know, sort of the, you know, um, I sort of think of them as like, you know, do they have a invisible scarlet R on their forehead, you know, a scarlet letter or like they, the reactionary regresses the campus or do they more broadly represent the campus community? I can say that my student, my classrooms are very diverse. Um, I have students of every ethnicity, um, of you know different racial and social backgrounds, uh, different religious backgrounds. I've had you know Israelis and Palestinians. More recently, I've had a lot of students from the Abrahamic Accord countries. You know, Moroccan students, students from the UAE, um, other um, other Muslim and Arab students. I certainly have the full gamut of Jewish students from those who are involved in you know sort of I guess we could say from Jewish Voices to Peace to Chicago. Jewish day school. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased with the diversity of my classes, but I don't know how it truly reflects the larger campus environment. Thanks. That's great. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Um, sort of an observation and a question. I mean, so much of the anti Zionism is involved with conspiracy theories, exaggerations, outright lies. I, I find very, very hard to separate anti-Semitism from anti-Zionism. Um, what have I you think, noticed on campus? Uh, what I've noticed is, is I think that there are ways to do this. And we have kind of a promulgation of various definitions of Zionism. I am partial to what is known as the ERA or the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's version of anti-Semitism, which I think lays out some different case studies that might help us differentiate between these two ideas. But I would say that there's just a tremendous lack of knowledge in about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in those who are, particularly those who are, you know, um, putting up all those, you know, memes and infographics on Instagram. Um, where most people are consuming their knowledge. You know, most people are not reading the 300 page books that I'm assigning in my classes. They're, you know, looking at one, uh, you know, one infographic on Instagram. I mean, I joke sometimes that we should just, you know, shut down the university and create like the institution of TikTok studies because that's where people are consuming their knowledge today. And they're not interested in the kind of um, historically and, uh, and, you know, factually based discussions that I think that we're having um, that we're having in the university space. And there's really a distinct clash, I guess, between the kind of work that you do at a university um, and the kind of, you know, and the kind of things that my students and others are exposed to in their day-to-day -day life. Um, I would say that, you know, in reference to both your question and Stan's question earlier, that my students in Northwestern still want to you know, still want to try and learn. They haven't given up on that entirely. And, you know, they're often willing to take, I guess, what I would consider to be maybe like socially unpopular opinions in the in the interest of trying to have a more nuanced conversation. But I do think that nuance um, has gone completely out the window. And you can see this in many of the cases that in fact, you know, I saw this very prominently in the discussion. I, I, I don't know what happened there, but I would say I'm not a forensic expert. I don't have any you know, inside knowledge, but I would say in the case of the um, unfortunate uh, killing of the journalist Shireen Abu Akhle in, in, uh, outside of Janine a couple, uh, about a month and a half ago, 
you know, I felt often that people knew who had murdered her, you know, two months before the bullet left the gun. And I think that's the kind of conversation that we're having today is that there's already a presupposition of who is to blame and what the facts are and what, you know, what the tenor of the conversation should be. Um, and in that case, just circling back to your original point, I think that then we're really getting into the discussion of, are you singling out the state of Israel and its behavior um, in a way that you would not talk about other nation states or other religious communities or otherwise. And then that I think is where we, you know, I think you could say that there is certainly something here that's, that smells of anti-Semitism. Hi, Toby. Hi, this has been absolutely fascinating. I, and I would, you were talking so fast because um, I know you were trying to cram as much stuff in, but I'm sure I missed something. But my question to you is, for those of us who don't live in TikTok Nation um, and actually want to learn some things that are beneficial, with all the books that are out there about the giving, providing a historical perspective to the Israeli, well, to the, to, to the Israel history issue and the issues associated with all of this. Like, it's very easy for me to say, yay, I'm, I'm a, you know, you couldn't get much more Zionist than right here, but I don't, I don't know enough to have that opinion. So is there any way you could provide us and maybe uh, after the fact here, because I guess this isn't really the place to do it, some of your recommendations to your students, because I'm not averse to reading those 300 page books that you assign to them. Great. Um, at first, maybe I um, will have an opportunity to circulate kind of a bibliography to Rabbi Shmuley after the session that can give you some recommendations for readings. Um, I would also suggest that one of the things that I do most of my students, um, and I think that is a valuable exercise, is actually reading, you know, reading these texts in, in, in their own words. Um, so I am partial to primary source documents or compilations and anthologies of primary source documents where you know, you read a little bit of what Herzl and Chada Am and also more contemporary thinkers have to say about Zionism. I think that's the best way to learn is to, you know, sort of see experience in the flesh. I'm also, of course, partial to visiting, you know, visiting the state of Israel and also the occupied territories um, and, you know, seeing everything for yourself and making up your own mind, which I think is a very important aspect of, in I there. guess I would say, <laughs> education. Um, so, I mean, hopefully in the kind of post-COVID universe that I don't think we're exactly yet in, uh, we all have more opportunities to do that. I would also say, though, that what, what you're suggesting is part of a larger dynamic that really worries me about diaspora-Israel relations, which is that um, since the 1967 war, I think much of Zionist affiliation, particularly within the American Jewish community, which geographically is much farther away from Israel than some other diasporas that have the opportunity to visit and interact with Israel in a more sustained way, you know, something like 90% of British teenagers where I used to teach had been to Israel. Today, I don't know how what that percentage would be in, in the United States, but I would say, you know, prior to age 18, maybe mostly only Orthodox teenagers had been to Israel. I would suppose maybe 30% of the American, you know, of American Jewish teenagers have been to Israel. So that's just a profound difference in the way we interact with the state of Israel, because here we sort of see it as an idea, a place that we project a lot of, um, project a lot of our feelings and understandings upon, but it's not a place that we interact with with the same regularity of other diaspora communities. Um, and since the 1967 war in general, I think much of Zionist sentiment has been built on deep feeling, but somewhat shallow knowledge. I off, you know, I've been to the APAC conference, and I sometimes wonder that if I polled the 18,000 attendees in the stadium, how many of them well, would know who Ahada Am is? Probably not, you know, probably not majority. Um, and I think that's something that's lacking in our Zionist education is that uh, uh, while I think it is important to instill um, a connection with the state of Israel. I think it's also important to instill an informed connection with the state of Israel. And that I think is why we're hearing the critique from the young generation. Although I think there's less and less evidence for this being the case in day school education today, but you often hear from you know, university students, well, they didn't tell us the whole story or they lied to us or we weren't fully informed. And I think that we're setting ourselves up for failure if we're not um, engaging with the difficult questions and also just the diversity of viewpoints um, that deserve to be heard because it's the richness, I think, of, um, of, the, of Jewish and Zionist thought that um, you know, would inspire the next generation as much as you know, turning them off from a larger connection with, um, with the state of Israel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before I go over to our next question with Dr. Erwin Sandler, I, um, I just want to invite folks to post in the chat uh, 
books on this issue that have uh, resonated for you. And if you're willing to share a sentence as to why, that would also be helpful. Um, Professor Hirschhorn also kindly offered to share a bibliography, which if you email um, Alex or learn at, um, then uh, she can forward that along to you as well, uh, if you want to do some reading. I'm also going to post in the chat uh, her book um, on the city hilltop, American Israeli movement over there. Okay, yes, hi, Erwin. Uh, thank you, Shmuley. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hershon, a wonderful presentation. One of the things that I have been very distressed about over the last number of years is the um, disaffection or the separation of the Jewish pro-Zionist community from the progressive community and the progressive community's embrace of the Palestinian movement uh, and pretty much the anti-Zionist movement. Um, and so I'm wondering what your conversations have been like with progressive Jews um, who, um, who are influenced by that and who perhaps have, um, you know, people like Jewish Voice for Peace, but not only Jewish, you know, like the African-American community and the uh, Latino community, which normally I would um, feel compatible with. Uh, but um, I've had been told to me, well, if you're a Zionist, you can't join us. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you're out there. Uh, what have your conversations been like? In the pre-COVID days, I had a student who came into my office and he, you know, sat down on the sat down on the chair and said, you know, Sarah, I'm gay, I'm pro-abortion, I'm pro-immigration reform, I vote for the Democratic Party, I'm active in liberal causes, but I'm also a Zionist and I don't know where I belong anymore. And he said, What do I do? And I and I and I, you know, I sort of laughed, you know, and said to him, You think that adults have all the answers for you? And you know, I'm barely an adult. So um, it's certainly a concern for this generation of students. And I love this question because in fact, I'm writing a book about it right now. And I guess my answer to this question is that everything that we're seeing today is not new. You know, the, the, the proverb that the, you know, there's nothing new under the sun applies also to the relationship between Zionism and the progressive movement. And the book that I'm working on really tries to trace um, this early iteration of these debates um, that came immediately after the 1967 war, um, first within the black power community, but then largely spread to the new left. Um, and I guess what we would call the progressive community of the 60s and 70s, um, you know, is really repeating itself today. And the question is, is can we derive any lessons from that first historical chapter between, I guess, the 1967 war and the Zionism is racism convention in the United Nations in 1975 to help us muddle through this period today? What I can say about this is that it's not, um, it, it seems, I think, from the media that, uh, that this is uh, entirely incompatible. And I'm worried that we are moving in that direction. But I think that there are also still spaces and places where Zionists can work um, well with their allies in progressive community and that, you know, they're having difficult and uh, you know, sometimes painful, but I think important conversations that are still happening and that there are, there are um, groups and organizations and institutions that still have goodwill to try to um, either sometimes I think maybe problematically resurrect a kind of, you know, alliance to the past for the future or who today really truly do want to have those conversations. But I think that the, the, the edges are hardening and it is becoming increasingly difficult in some, some places and spaces to make that conversation happen. I'm not sure if that's because um, there is a true, um, well thought out um, objection to Zionism and perhaps the activities of the state of Israel today, particularly, um, I guess we could say um, most of the critique I think falls on post-1967 Israel and the occupation, um, the occupation of the Palestinian territories. But I think it also has to do more largely with the way the progressive movement see, you know, the progressive movement's worldview today, which is, you know, I guess founded on these pillars of, um, of uh, protesting against colonialism, um, state violence and patriarchy and Zionism and state of Israel sort of falls conveniently within these narratives, which I think that if we wanted to have a more 
robust discussion about whether that's, you know, whether that fits the Zionist case or not, we could find both, you know, su you know, support and against in various arguments if we think about the diversity of the Zionist idea, but in the most simplified form, which I think is what, you know, the progressive movement's worldview has to apply to the, the entire universe and not just to the specific case of Israel-Palestine. Um, I think, you know, Zionism sort of fits in there and that's why we're seeing such a conflict. I think it's also that um, some of these movements have had um, a transnational vision going back to the 1960s. You know, this language of from Ferguson to Palestine or, you know, from Minneapolis to Palestine or, um, you know, a lot of the conversations we're having um, has been circulating for now for over 50 years. These go back to the 1967 war and it's hard to um, dissociate them you know, from the conversation we're having, say, on race in the United States, it's hard after 50 years of having these ideas circulate to then necessarily dissociate them from a different conversation I think we're having in Israel-Palestine. So it's very, you know, there's a long history to this. And I think that that everything seems new today, but it really isn't. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, sort of structure that's built up around some of these discourses over the past 50 years. And those are very difficult to, um, to uh, dissuade. But mostly I think there's also just frankly, on both sides of this equation, and I think that this was referred to in, in our previous question um, um, that Toby asked, it's just, I think that there's a lot of deep feeling, but also not a lot of deep knowledge on both sides of the debate. And that's, you know, fueling a lot of this sense of incompatibility um, when I think that there could be, there could be ways to have a more productive dialogue that, that also requires um, sometimes more work than, than I think both sides really want to undertake to have a more functional relationship. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, hi, Aglaia. Hi, so, okay. My question is gonna sound really, really weird. So please bear with me on this. So, but um, it comes from my world civilizations classes. So talking about nationalism in the 19th century and how that came out of the, um, well, a nice thing to call it would be a quagmire of European politics um, in the 19th century. The idea, um, when we started off and we're talking about uh, the point about, well, do you have to have an actual geographic territory in order? Um, my mind, sorry, went immediately to the hypocrite to end all hypocrites of that so-called den of hypocrisy called the Enlightenment, that anyone has the audacity to call the Enlightenment, but Jean-Jacques Rousseau and discourse on inequality. And the first time someone put a fence around a piece of land and called it his and convinced everybody that, that he was right, that's when all kinds of, you know, like, you know, civilization began. The idea of nation, though, since, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why my mind went there, though, the idea of what actually is a nation has been evolving over time. And so what I'm kind of curious about, and I don't know if, you know, you want to speak to this or not, though, but how have even the ideas of what actually makes a nation affected the discourse on Zionism? Sure. So, you know, um, of course, all of these Zionist thinkers were profoundly influenced by European ideas about nationalism. Uh, you know, we often say, oh, these Zionist thinkers were, you know, they're European nationalists and colonialists. Well, obviously, that was the that was the world in which the, their ideas emerged from. It was a world, in, you know, their their fellow inter intellectual travelers all, um, you know, came from that came from that milieu. So it's no surprise that you know some of their ideas, particularly Herzl's ideas, were deeply inflected by his understanding of you know modern European history and. Um, you know, and him living in a kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic empire in uh, in Vienna also was part of his understanding of what you know things things could look like. Um, so I think there's a lot of that conversation. I think what you're also pointing to though is this tension between you know what comes first, the nation or the state, and then even afterwards, what's more important, the nation or the state? And you sort of hear that in Zionism. I guess we could almost say that Chadam believed the nation was more important than the state, whereas Herzl would say the state. You know, the state yeah. would then allow for the nation to develop. And I think we're still having these like, these conversations because these are really relevant to the solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today. Part of the reason that much of the international community and certainly, um, you know, I think uh, probably many in this room, um, you know, are supporters of the two-state solution is because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily require those ideas to come to conflict. You get both your nation and your state and everybody kind of has their happy or unhappy divorce and, you know, Palestinians hopefully will also get their state and nation separate from uh, the Zionist state and nation. But um, the, you know, more 
as the two-state solution seems increasingly difficult to implement for a whole variety of reasons that I won't get into here, I think these one-state visions um, you know, bring these questions of nation and state into further attention. You know, if you think about a one-state vision, well, Israel will continue to rule over the Palestinian territories without granting, um, without granting Palestinian citizenship in the state of Israel, you know, if they, whether or not they would want it, which is another outstanding question. But then you have a Palestinian nation that's living stateless within, within a Zionist state. The alternative vision that the Palestinian, most of the Palestinian national community, I think, has been advancing of late of um, a state for all citizens. Again, um, you know, from a democratic perspective, people think, oh, one state, you know, uh, one vote, you know, one man or woman, or um, you know, I guess we could say any gender, any gender that you please, one, one, one vote um, seems very democratic. But what I think, uh, what particularly concerns the Zionist communities because of the demographic balance, which will mean that there are actually more votes of Palestinians than there would be of, um, of I guess, Zionists. What worries the, the state of Israel about this solution is that the Zionist idea of a nation, the Zionist idea of self-determination, the Zionist idea of sovereignty would effectively be erased in this one state for all the citizens. So these questions about nation and state are still very, um, viable and, um, you know, part of the mix of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today, um, and there's no necessary um, solution that history has provided to where this should go. Great. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Okay, time for one more question, if we have one, from someone we haven't heard from yet, perhaps. I can start calling folks out. Don't be shy. Eddie, no, okay. Hi, Eddie. Can, can I ask a question okay yes hi dale okay yeah or just a couple um answer to the to to the critics of the ih um r um solution for anti-semitism as a anti-semitism definition and two can't you have why couldn't it can't israel be both a state for all its citizens and the nation state of the Jewish people can't it can't it can't it be both together um and and uh, I guess those are my two questions okay and uh, thank you Dale and just before you respond to that I want to bring Eddie's voice in too so Eddie if you'll share your question and then uh, Dr. Hirshhorn you can conclude on those yeah no thank you so much um uh, my question was just how important is language when addressing a, a lot of these issues um, because I know that uh, having the right language and maybe when having dialogue on these language and terms like colonial state are, are thrown in, how important is it to have accurate language when having these conversations? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll start with Eddie's question first. And, and, and I would say that if we're going to have dialogue about these conversations, we can't reject um, you know, the terms of the debate that the progressive community in particular is having out of hand. Um, and I think it's important to you know, meet people on their own terms um, and we can you know, we can um, deconstruct some of those terms and, you know, discuss their application to the case study of, um, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But I do, um, I do find it problematic when the discussion is, no, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to reject that whole, that whole level of discourse, um, because I don't think that's an effective way to, you know, meet, meet um, your partner halfway. Um, and I think that also if you're using two different vocabularies, um, you know, you're really never going to be able to establish trust and the ability to have dialogue. So um, that I think is really important. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that um, one of the questions I think we have about um, uh, the way, and this, this leads directly into Dale's question about the way anti-Semitism in particular is being defined, particularly with the involvement of the state of Israel, is do we let other communities beyond the Jewish community kind of define our terms and define our circumstances for us? And I would argue no, that other communities don't necessarily get to adjudicate what anti-Semitism is for the Jewish community, just in the way that I wouldn't want the Jewish community, say, adjudicating what anti-Blackness is or uh, or you know, Islamophobia is for other for other groups. So I think it is important for Jews, in some sense, to retain control over the terms that they use. Um, for that reason, I'm partial to the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism um, above um, some of the other working definitions that have um, that have come about. Only because I think those other working definitions don't don't necessarily represent the vast majority, um, particularly of American Jews. They're kind of uh, definitions that have been 
um, you know, uh, assembled by many of my colleagues in academia, but I think that they don't necessarily represent the broad majority of the way American Jews think about anti-Semitism. And I think it's important to have the larger, you know, I think it would be great to have a definition that included all these voices, but I think for the, for the you know, practical purposes, we at least need the definitions that include the majority of voices. And I think that's, um, that's important. Um, I'm sorry, Dale, I, your, your final question about, uh, could you just remind me what your second question was? The second question was, couldn't Israel be both uh, a Jew, uh, uh, the nation state of the Jewish people and a state for all its citizens both? One doesn't necessarily have to, uh, uh, to contradict another, does it? I I'm not hearing you. I'm sorry, I uh, accidentally got muted there. Um, I think this like leads back also to our previous question, um, which is, you know, sort of what what comes first, the state or the nation, and, and you know what what happens from there on. Again, returning to Herzl's vision, Herzl's vision for was of Jerusalemstadt was for a state of the Jews, and not necessarily a Jewish state. One that I think we think of more traditionally associated with the state of Israel today. One that has less of a separation of religion and state than it did in previous. Um, in previous years, um, one that puts more emphasis on the Jewish character of the state rather than the democratic character of the state of Israel. Um, what I think has evolved in terms of the Zionist idea, which isn't really based on, is no longer based on an ideology. Um, you know, the state of Israel today is not only a state of the Jews because it, it, it sees itself uh, in that vision, it also believes that it needs to have the demographic majority in order to ensure that vision. Now, I can't say I'm not, you know, I'm not a member of the security establishment in Israel. I can't say whether that's right or wrong. I mean, in a state for all of its citizens, the Zionist character of the state um, would disappear. I believe that if there was goodwill on both sides, it's probably possible to have a binational state where both Zionist and Palestinian national um, agendas and visions are somehow honored. But right now, I think the state of Israel believes that that won't be possible um, and that the only thing that's really buttressing the possibility of the continuity of the Zionist idea is the Zionist demographic majority between uh, in the in the parcels of the territory that it controls. Um, and this uh, obviously is an enormous complication in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that we're no longer talking about. Um, you know, the legitimacy of the Zionist idea, both, uh, you know, in Israel, Palestine, but also in the international community, but we're talking about having the demography and the military might to protect it, which have been, you know, various elements of Zionist thinking over time, but I think that is the direction in which um, the state of Israel has pivoted is that it feels the need to guarantee those things um, as much as the legitimacy of ideas itself. And maybe that's a good place to conclude because it tells us a lot about where um, you know, Zionism is today and what its future might be. Thank you so much. I love that we can take such a big, heavy topic and um, have such a respectful, smart conversation about it. Thank you, Dr. Hirschhorn, for this presentation. Thank you all thank for you your to all of you. Thank you all for your thoughtful questions and thank you for your book recommendations on the side. Dr. Hirschhorn will send us a big bibliography and we'll send it to all of you. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining us. And our next program is tomorrow. Uh, with Dr. Joshua Shane's the, uh, the Battle of Definitions, What is Anti-Semitism and Why Does Its Definition Matter? Kind of a, a little bit connected to our conversation today. Have a great day, everyone. God bless. Thank well. you so much. I really appreciate um, you know, your, your, your wonderful questions and the conversation we had today. Rabbi Shmuley, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we could make this happen. And um, uh, tune in tomorrow. I'm sure it will uh, be an interesting conversation that you know, complements what we discussed we had today. Refua Shlema, all the best. Thank you.